Welcome. This is Business Edge on New Central. I'm Tolulokwe Adelaru Balogun. This is our headline story, Zambia's Mines, Issues and Solutions, Part 2. Today, we will continue with the discussion on the mineral-rich nation of Zambia. Now, this nation had issues concerning its mineral wealth and has been trying many solutions. The current cycle involves external development partners like the World Bank and IMF. We'll look at this and more. Welcome. This is Business Edge. On February the 11th, the International Monetary Fund, IMF, started discussions with Zambian officials concerning a loan program and debt relief. This could be the first of many of Africa's pandemic era, era sovereign defaults. Now, many other factors could weigh heavy on the deliberations. These include the controversial mining deal or takeover, an election coming in August, and a mountain of debt to China that is looming. So the IMF team is holding virtual meetings with Zambian officials over a three-week period after Lusaka requested a program with the fund in December of 2020. We know that in January 2021, debt relief under a new common framework by the group of 20 major economies designed to help the world's poorest countries tackle their debt burden and Zambia could take advantage of this. Now, together with Zambia and the World Bank, the IMF will draft a debt sustainability analysis that will form the basis for both. Holders of Zambia's $3 billion worth of euro bonds accept that they will face a right down, but they want a seat at the table. The Bank of Zambia has decided to raise the benchmark interest rates by 50 basis points to 8.5%, and this suggests an openness to guidance from the IMF. Joining me on Business Edge is Chibamba Kanyama. He's an economist, a former communications advisor for the International Monetary Fund, and he joins us from Lusaka, Lusaka Zambia. Uh, Chibamba, thanks so much for joining me, and good to see you again. Thank you very much, and you're most welcome. All right, so let's get into this. Um, we start with what is the elephant in any discussion about uh, Zambia at this point in time, and that is the fact that they became the first African country to default. Now, aside from talks about the bailout, what else is the government doing to address the fallout from the actual defaults? Well, the first thing is that government uh, <clears throat> decided to default. Um, government decided to default, giving two reasons. Uh, the first one being that they don't have the actual money. Uh, the first default done about 43 million US dollars. And the latest one is about 53 million US dollars, which brings the total default to around 100 million. The question is can a government the size of Zambia default on a, an amount so small? You know, when you're talking about a country, uh, this is a sovereign country, and less than 100 million US dollars. The explanation by the Minister of Finance was that they want to treat all creditors the same. In other words, they have creditors who are not bondholders. These are Chinese creditors. Mm. And the defaulting was carrying on the bondholders. So the ministry says, look, if we have to pay one group of creditors, then we must pay all the others. Um, and because we, they are not in a position to pay everybody else, they would rather default. Wow. Now, remember that Zambia, Zambia has ad, debt advisors who are helping the country to restructure the debt. This is uh, Lazard, and um, they have been in the country uh, for quite a number of months now, about six months, advising the government on how to restructure the debt. And I'm sure they're the ones who are engaging creditors. Uh, so that's one of the strategies, engage the different creditors, the bondholders, the private sector, commercial debt, commercial creditors from China, engage them at the same time. Mm. Uh, the only challenge here is whether China will fully come to the table. China has already given some bit of concessions, restructured part of the debt to be paid forward, but that's just a small percentage of the total debt, yeah. which is up between three to five billion or to Chinese pays, Chinese commercial tax. It's interesting. So Zambia is taking this interesting stance where 
they're saying if we can't afford to pay everybody we'd rather default and pay no one that 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 says a lot but let's talk about this uh, zambia chinese debt just a bit more now the majority of zambia's international debt is owed to china it is believed that of the total 11.7 billion about 12 billion dollars um owed to international creditors as you said it's about three to 3.5 uh, billion dollars that is owed to china so you said that china has been willing to renegotiate restructure a small percentage but what are we looking at going forward would china actually consider forgiveness would we see a renegotiation or would we see china even offering zambia more loans which would then just dig a deeper hole for the country we see much more of a monetarium, and that's the restructuring debt we paid forward. Uh, Chinese debt has been the problematic debt for Zambia because, number one, uh, Chinese debt is a moving target. Um, it's a moving target because we have signed contracts. Number one, we signed contracts for a number of projects to be executed by Chinese companies and funded by Chinese financial financial firms. Mm. Um, now, uh, because of the same debt stress we are in, government rescoped some of the investments or uh, infrastructure investment. In other words, they, they, they brought down the size uh, of, of engagement. And the two, they suspended some of the projects. The only challenge with suspension is that it goes with a penalty. Uh, once we engage somebody, uh, even if the, the, the agreement has not yet set as a date, the uh, contractors still want to be paid. So much of this date has been a moving target from China and that it comes on board in the treasury as we go on. And this is the challenge again with the International Monetary Fund, why we have not managed the program for quite a while now. Because the IMF is really concerned about date sustainability. And the, the area of debt sustainability is that we do not know exactly how much Zambia owes the Chinese firms. Wow. We we how much Zambia owes the bondholders. It's three billion. That is it. And to be paid over a period of 2022, 2025, and so forth. But for the Chinese debt, number one, we do not have information for some of the debt on the actual agreements with the Chinese firms. Number two, we don't even really know how much is coming on board. Of course, the Minister of Finance will give you the data, but others will contain that some of the data is still coming on board and it is a moving target. So when it comes to uh, negotiating with Chinese state, number one, we rule out forgiveness. That is not coming forward. I mean, the Chinese companies will not... Will not this is commercial data, by the way. It's not government to government data. It's not bilateral data, China, Zambia. It's commercial data. It's not bilateral data. It's is they are making money out of this so the, the best they can do is to restructure this debt under moratorium to be paid over a longer period of time than the period which has been agreed are, are you worried about this lack of transparency i'm going to give a, a bit of a diversion here this lack of transparency in chinese loan agreements be them government to government or commercial agreements because that actually has been a criticism of how china is operating within the african continent so you have an idea but you're not exactly sure it's difficult to put actual numbers and you know um genuine prices and costs to some of these things isn't that a concerning situation when it comes to dealing with how african countries are taking on so much chinese debt well for africa it is a very big concern now within the zambian context uh, it has been a concern until recently when government really began to be very transparent about debt. They have been communicating a lot about how much is owed. Uh, every quarter, the Minister of Finance has been coming for the previous Minister of Finance, Madam Margaret Manakatwe, began the process. And that was part of what I personally was advising government as well behind the scenes, that communicate more and more and more and be much more transparent about debt. Now, the reason there is some level of mistrust on how and misunderstanding about Chinese debt is that prior to 2017, most of the contracts between Chinese firms and the Zambian government were not signed by the Minister of Finance, who by law is authorized to sign these loans. So individual ministers would travel to China and they will sign a contract. And then it, it took time for the Minister of Finance to realize, actually, there was a contract signed by my counterpart minister. 
and that is already a loan. Uh, and I, I can give you many examples around most of those such loans, like digital migration and others. So the Minister of Finance found himself or herself coming to terms with how much Zambia really owes China because there was no signature. So when the Chinese firms realized that by Zambian law, only the Minister of Finance is allowed to sign loans, they, bring, they began to renegotiate those loans again to have the Minister of Finance to sign them properly. That's why now we're beginning to know how much Zambia owes Chinese banks. It has been a process of transparency, and this is now coming on board. That's on one hand. And on the other hand, because we are desperate for an IMF program, we got no choice but to begin to disclose as much as we can. Yeah. So as far as things stand today, I think we have come close to understanding exactly what our financial obligations are in terms of debt. Okay, so books have got to be open for uh, Zambia to be able to have access to some of the things it's looking for. Before we go on break, the talks between Zambian officials and development partners actually started the day of our last conversation, the day we last spoke. Um, so between now and then, what parameters are in play? What, what do we know is sort of like the rules of engagement in regards to Zambia's situation? At the moment, Zambia is negotiating with the IMF, as you said in your introduction. They discuss, this is a combination of Article 4. Article 4 is really a health check, which IMF is mandated to do for all member states. Uh, they do that for some countries every two years, to Zambians every year. They engage on Article 4. is to really assess the stability of the country and provide advice on interventions to be carried out by the authority. This is not about a program, it's simply about a health check. But the IMF for the first time after three, four years has come forward to restart the negotiations on possibilities of a funded program. Now, this is where we are. They began the discussions on the 11th of, of, um, of February and ending on the 3rd next week. Um, everything has been very, very tight so far. Uh, but what I know is that most of the talks have gone on to scrutinize the date position of Zambia. This is because the item of this time wants to ensure that Zambia is date sustainable. So they want to find out what measures government has taken, has taken account of to ensure debt is sustainable. And one of the things that government is taking to the IMF is the economic recovery program that was launched in December by the president himself. Some indications, five pillars on how Zambia will begin to discipline itself based on the Public Finance Management Act of 2018, which is really about accountability, fiscal consolidation, and of course, stopping uh, accruing any new debt. Um, what I anticipate that I will come to the table, and uh, of course, maybe funding after the elections. All right, so Chibaba, we're going to take a break here. When we come back, we'll talk about the other elephant in the room, and that has to do with the Glencore mine, as well as what that decision for the country to take on more debt, about $1.5 billion worth of it, could actually mean in the future. This is Business Edge. We're talking about Zambia's mines and the issues and solutions. Do stay with us. And we are, of course, still here for you. This is Business Edge right here on New Central. My guest, Shibamba Kayama, is still with me. Now let's get to the other big elephant in the room when it comes to Zambia. And it's actually a new elephant, I guess we would say. And that involves the decision by the state-owned Zambia Consolidated Copper Mines Limited to take on $1.5 billion of debt and pay a nominal $1 to take over 73% um, of the Glencore mine, that's the Mopana, Mopani copper mines from the Swiss commodities trader Glencore. So, Chibamba, I have to ask, first of all, Glencore is willing to sell this mine for a nominal $1. What does that tell you about the valuation that Glencore has put on it? And is that valuation based solely on the in-country challenges and not actually the potential of the mine? 
Well, in, in terms of the valuation, uh, there have been a lot of arguments as to what the mine is worth. The Glencore initially forwarded about 3.5 billion US dollars, 4 billion US dollars. Um, uh, and other analysts simply say the true value of the mine is what it's traded for, which is 1.5 billion US dollars. And that's what Glencore finally has offloaded. Um, the $1 itself is just symbolic of a transaction, just to show that a transaction has taken place because Zambia has not paid any amount of money upfront to Glencore. Okay. Glenco has simply said, look, here's your mind, uh, but pay us, not for the assets, because it's, it's got value. If you are going to take it over, we are not ready to continue mining right now. If there's a willing buyer, there's a land government, please take it over. And therefore, government has bought the mine uh, from Glenco. And according to the agreement, the, the loan will be paid off the cash flows of Mopan uh, Mine. So whatever will be generated for the next 10 years or so will go towards paying uh, the mine. And, and well, Glencoe itself has ring fenced the income, has ring fenced the income. In other words, they have they are the off takers of all the trans all the sales of, of copper. They will be buying off copper at an agreed price from Opani, from where they will be getting their money. Um, so um, they. It is, it's a date that is sitting on the books of ZCCMRH, if you may like it. It's a date that's sitting on Mopan itself. However, for um, uh, international multilateral donors who are coming on board to support Zambia, such as the International Monetary Fund, that, according to the definition of IMF, any private date by a parastate or state-owned organization, such as Mopani, is, is guaranteed date by the state. Because at the end of the day, if we cannot settle that date, Zambia government has to still pay claim. So according to the IMF, definitely that 1.5 billion US dollars is an addition to the 12 billion uh, external debt that Zambia has. So now we're looking at $13.5 billion that Zambia, a nation so rich in uh, mineral is, resources, yeah. owes. So let me ask, what about the justification for this deal? Does it make sense to you when you're hearing that the state-owned uh, Copper Mines Limited is buying back uh, Mopani instead of maybe looking for an international buyer, or looking for a consortium, looking for other alternatives? Does it make sense for them to voluntarily take on this debt and possibly struggle to make this mine more uh, valuable and make it uh, something that brings in more profit for the country? It, it, it won't make sense if government fails to find an equity partner. It definitely won't make sense. I personally do not believe that mining should fall in the hands of government. Maybe Chile has succeeded as a one good example, but within the context of Zambia, we have had this case before. We have had a lot of learning, and I don't think there has been any much improvement to justify government taking over mine. And the Minister of Finance himself has come to the realization we do not have that full capacity to run Mopani mine. And that's why we must urgently find an EPIC partner. Now, if we find an EPIC partner, it will, it will make sense because then we are able to transfer some of their liabilities to the new partner or the new partner's recapitalization or injection of liquidity will neutralize what we all claim. All right, Chibamba, we're going to pause this conversation here. Uh, as we did last time, it continues to build. So, of course, we will be touching base when we see more in terms of the framework of the IMF World Bank um, Zambia deal, as well as whatever the Chinese decision happens to be. So we know that there are going to be future conversations on this, and we'll definitely be touching base with you uh, in Lusaka, Zambia, to give us some of the details and the behind-the-scenes wrangling. You are, of course, as you said, uh, in a way, uh, negotiating and basically advising the government as well. So we do appreciate your time and your insight today. Thank you. You're most welcome. All right, we'll see you next time. All right, and that was our guest, Chibamba uh, Kiyama, joining us from Lusaka, Zambia, as we looked at Zambia's minds, the issues and the solutions. Now we look at NC4 to watch as we wrap things up. We start in Nigeria, where the country's finance minister and, and minister for finance, budget and national planning, Zainab Ahmed, says the government has released the sum of 1.74 trillion naira to ministries, departments and agencies for capital expenditure as at December 2020. She also added that government dispersed 
118.37 billion naira for COVID-19 capital expenditure from the fund. Now we are back. So we have President Adama Barrow of Gambia that has commissioned a newly installed $28.4 million power plant in Berikama, West Coast region. The commissioning of the 20 megawatt power plants was part of activities marking the country's 56th independence anniversary. It's a project that is jointly funded by the government of the Gambia and its development partner, the Islamic Development Bank. Moving to the southern part of the continent, despite the 15.63% tariff hike to be implemented on April 1st, ESCOM considers its, its electricity tariffs to be far from cost reflective. And to bring it to cost reflectivity would have required a tariff jump to 150 cents on the kilowatt hour on average instead of 134. And this is coming from ESCOM's general manager for regulations. And finally, the Central Bank of Kenya received bids worth 29.97 Kenyan 29.97 billion Kenyan shillings from the weekly treasury bills auction from the 24 billion Kenyan shillings offered an oversubscription of 124.91%. Now bids worth 28.8 billion Kenyan shillings were accepted at the auction the first time the T bills auction has been oversubscribed in weeks happening this year. And that's it on this edition of Business Edge. Don't forget to follow us on social media. I will see you next time. My name is Solope Adelaru Palu.